the, the announced title of the talk was on cybersecurity research challenges, but I'm actually going to give you a short mini talk first on the topic that's actually consumed virtually all of my attention for the last month, but I've got to play historian. And I have this antiquarian interest in old telegraph code books. In fact, I thought about giving my talk on that. He had decided to give a more mainstream talk. But telegraph code books go back to about 1845 or so. Uh, reached the technological peak, 1920s, maybe 1930s, died out basically after the, mostly died out after the war. They were mostly for economy and also correctness, and let you abbreviate a whole phrase. Identity can be established if the party will answer that his or her mother's maiden name is. Could be represented by either the single word guinea pig or the number 05626. Why? Because telegraph companies charged by the word. First transatlantic cable, $5 a word. Five eighteen sixty-three dollars a word. Very expensive, in other words. You send one word instead of this whole phrase. This also proves, by the way, that using mother's maiden name for authentication of financial transactions goes way back. And about a month ago, I was spending some time at their afternoon in Washington, went to the Library of Congress. Because I'm a security guy, I looked not just at code books, but ones that talked about secrecy. So I found this one by a guy named Frank Miller. And he was describing a way to do what's called the super encipherment of the code, book, code points. Particularly, typically what you do, and that's the bottom half of this, you take the, the numeric value, add your key to it, and then translate back into code word space. Numbers are harder to send in Morse code than letters. But the, what was interesting was the first half of this quotation. Some of you are crypto folks. Tell me, tell me what this code book is describing. He calls them shift numbers. Today we call them additives in the code book. What, 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 what kind of cipher is he describing here? What? One-time pad, yes. This is a one-time pad. He stressed not reusing. He stressed not using irregular numbers, irregular sequences. Uh, today we'd use the word random, but I think irregular will do quite nicely for a man who's a self-described banker. The only problem is that this is, was invented in 1882, 35 years before Vernon and Mauburn, who were, who were credited with inventing the one-time pad. And you know, the Official story, a guy from Bell Labs, a guy from the U.S. Army Signal Corps. These are the people you'd expect to invent a really good new crypto system. Here we have a banker inventing it. A banker in a, what was then a very remote part of the United States. Sacramento, a town of about 35,000. So the two interesting questions that come out of this are, who was this guy Frank Miller, and how did he invent it? And second, did his invention reach Vernon or Malborn? So that's where I spent the last month researching. It turns out, stroke of luck, he turned out to be a very prominent banker, president of a powerful bank in uh, 19th century California. So he left what for the time was a good paper trail. I found a lot out about him by reading the society pages of the San Francisco Chronicle. During the Civil War, and right after he worked as a, quote, clerk, unquote, I don't know what he did, in uh, an anti-fraud unit and in investigating Lincoln's assassination. This is probably where he got some exposure to cryptanalysis and cryptography, but I haven't been able to prove that yet. I'm not even certain that this is the guy, but there are only two Frank Millers living in Sacramento in, in 1880, the 1880 census, and the other was a laborer. And this guy had 16 years, he described himself as 16 years banking experience in 1882, which sounds like a start in 1866, right after the war, which describes this guy perfectly. So I'm 95% certain, but I haven't found the smoking gun to prove it. He almost certainly never met Vernon. He probably did not meet Malborn, though there was one slight chance of it that I've managed to identify. But... He almost virtually certainly met a guy, an army officer named Parker Hitt in 1907 at a military ball put on the, by the bachelor officers of the 22nd Infantry, 
so they could meet the daughters of the local gentry. He and his wife were squiring their daughter who indeed did marry one of these officers. And who was Parker Hitt? He was Malborn's mentor and colleague. And Hitt was the guy who first said, for security in a particular cipher, the key should be as long as the plain text. One of the essential steps towards the one-time pad. Did he hear this somehow from Miller? No proof yet. So, it is, clearly, it is clear that Miller invented the one-time pad 35 years earlier. Do I have the right one? About 95% certain. What in his background led him to create that? I still don't know. He just has this background in investigations. Did he explain his idea to Hit? Well, the party was also to celebrate the anniversary of the return of this regiment from the Philippines. The 19, in 1907, the word Philippines was the army equivalent of what today we would call Afghanistan, I believe. Uh, those who don't know that, go read up on U.S. Army history, U.S. history in the Philippines. But what did Hit do in the Philippines? Many different things, among other things, setting up communication lines. You can see him chatting with the father of this quote, unusually attractive, unquote, young woman, and saying, well, I, I worked on communications. Oh, I invented a code book in, 19, in 1882. Really, sir, how did that work? But I don't know this conversation took place. I have not yet found Miller's papers, though in 1887 they still existed. No, I'm sorry, in 1987, a descendant of his still had his papers. I have not managed to establish contact. Uh, Hitt's diary doesn't record anything. But we have the path, a plausible path, through 1907. When I'm doing computer science, I can think a lot and reinvent everything going back to Turing. When I'm doing history, I need diligence, but I also need luck. Did the paper get preserved? So that's where this stands right now. I've been, and uh, I hope to finish the paper in about a month, aimed at cryptologia. And now we'll go on to the advertised talk. Any questions about this one before I go on? Or? Yeah. So this is what we have right now. OK. So let's talk about cybersecurity research, which was the advertised topic of this talk. And the uh, text for uh, today's sermon comes from Nita Jones and William Wolfe, that it's hard for us to say that cyberspace is more secure than 35 years ago. I would have said 45, but I'll take that. And the second. Observation, and I've heard Wolf say this in person too, is that absent some fresh approach, they don't think things are going to get better anytime soon. We've been doing the same thing over and over again. Most security problems that we encounter are due to buggy code. You know, I love finding protocol flaws. I love finding crypto attacks on crypto protocols. It's great fun. But the sad fact is most problems are due to buggy code buffer overflows and the like. Our code is better today than 35 years ago. I'm no longer shocked when I find out that a computer has been up for more than a year without rebooting. I've seen it happen enough times. Uh, but the systems we're building are far more complex than the ones we had 35 years ago. And the rate of complexity and hence of bugginess has increased faster than the code quality. Even the massive security efforts like Microsoft has put into uh, Windows Vista and Windows 7 haven't solved the problem. This month, what was it? Three critical zero-day flaws in uh, their Patch Tuesday update? It's not getting better. More seriously from the perspective of the good guys, there haven't been any fundamentally new defensive ideas in a very long time. The basic mechanism we have is the wall, some sort of wall. One side are the bad guys, the other side are the good guys, or the trusted code, or, or what have you. And walls, walls are the easy part. They're far from perfect. But in general, we know how to build, with reasonable confidence, we can build a wall. The problem is that walls are not enough. We need a opening in the wall a door, a window, a gate, call it what you will. We're going to p permit things to pass through the wall, but in a controlled fashion, controlled by policy. And that's where we get into trouble. 
It's when we're trying to let something untrusted make a request of something trusted. And this is where we're getting into trouble. Structurally, we have the problem of what uh, author of a physics book called the problem of Sears versus craftspeople. He noted that, uh, this is Lee Smolin, noted that many sciences alternate between periods of radical change, where someone comes up with brilliant new ideas, and filling in the details, filling in the blanks, making it, the engineering of it to make it actually work. In security, right now, we're in the second phase. We're filling in a lot of things, but when I look, say, at the papers and security conferences, over the last, you know, the last time I saw a really large burst of new ideas was the late 90s when cryptography was suddenly becoming very common and has had a tremendous effect. But we're just kind of filling in the details now. We need a radical new idea about what to do about the security problem. Because the walls and gates model is not working. And there's no particular reason to think it's going to start in the future. So one, when I say wall, people think the word firewall. We're allowing too much, some of the failures. We've got the firewall, but we're allowing really complicated stuff to go through the firewall. JavaScript. You know, this is a Turing complete programming language. Why do you think you can contain it? PDF files, which are remarkably complex, and just to make sure we don't have any chance of keeping it secure, we now have JavaScript inside of PDF. And much more, much, much more. We're allowing all of the stuff through, and the firewall can't stop it, either because it doesn't know how to, or because you won't be able to get anything done. Try browsing the net without Flash. It's not or without JavaScript. I try. I usually have to re-enable it on selective sites. We're not sanitizing stuff correctly. And if you're a decent sized company, there are many holes that, in your firewall that are authorized. Some years ago, I asked the head of the network security group at AT&T Labs how many holes he knew of in the firewall. I probably shouldn't repeat the exact number, but it's a very large number. I don't think you would be wrong if you guessed 500 to 1,000. Authorized holes. And how many more do you think there are that you don't know about? Probably just as many. My co-author on the Firewalls book, Bill Cheswick, started a company whose business was mapping the net. Not mapping the internet, though that makes for pretty pictures. Mapping corporate networks to find out where the leaks were to the outside. If you can't control the leaks, maybe you can find them and plug them that way. And there are too many <coughs> devices, you know, my phone, my laptop, what have you, that live inside and outside the firewall. During the uh, London IETF meeting, I think this was 2002, 2003, found a dozen machines at the IETF that were, were infected with the Code Red virus. Code Red is something, oh, it attacked web servers. Why is a laptop running a web server? Oh, don't even ask. And you know, every one of these machines was going back inside their corporation the next week, except for the ones that were, were already infected the inside by tunneling in by a, by a virtual private network. The firewall wasn't keeping this stuff out. Operating systems have walls. It's the wall between the kernel and user space. And maybe the trust of the, the trust of the set UID programs and the rest. The privileged programs are the purpose of the privileged program is to extend privilege to the less trusted pieces. Try running something. You're not privileged, but you can run a set UID program, make a system call, pass through the wall to the trusted barrier. But that's kind of blurring things a little bit. And what's worse yet is applications. Today's applications really are like operating systems themselves. They take an untrusted input, often programmable input like JavaScript, they deal with input from multiple untrusted sources. They're trying to do resource management. That's an operating system, folks. But they're not built that way. And even if they were, they're getting penetrated just as much as any other operating system. They have their own walls and their own gates. 
Many of the attacks we see today do not attack the operating system kernel per se. They attack the application. And they do all their danger and all, their da all the damage, I should say, purely in the context of one user's ID. And this isn't new. When the internet worm hit in 1988, that was almost completely an unprivileged operation. I went back and reread the Orange Book, which was then current state of the art in building secure systems, and realized that it wouldn't have stopped it. So I went to someone who was older and wiser in the ways of security, still fairly new to it at that time, and said, excuse me, Orange Book wouldn't have stopped this. Oh yeah, it would, a B2 system would have. Well, why is that? B2 requires a thorough search for bugs. You know, yeah, well, I was new to security, but I was pretty sure even then that he had it wrong. But the point is the applications themselves are causing trouble. Think of the word macroviruses we had 10 years ago. Programmability in an application. So we come to the definition of insanity. I prefer the second definition in this case, which is doing the same thing over and over again, hoping for a different result. So I think we need a fundamentally different approach. <laughs> I'm starting from the assumption that the walls will fail and fail in unpredictable ways. Our intrusion detection systems are imperfect. And besides, all the intrusion detection system is telling you is you've been had. And the increased amount of connectivity through and around firewalls has rendered them effectively useless against any kind of sophisticated attack, let, let alone the very sophisticated attacks like uh, Stuxnet, which was an attack against a system that was not connected at all to the internet. USB flash drives are a powerful attack vector, it seems. Or so rumor has it. Anyway, we need a new approach. So let's start with by looking at the threat model. The traditional defensive model was based on the assumption that the good guys had more resources than the bad guys. That's no longer true. In fact, it's often quite the converse. Why? Because there's more motivation for the attackers. Most of the hacking we see today is profit-driven. There's a lot of money to be made in hacking systems. You know, when I started in this business, although everyone knew you could do that, most of the uh, attacks we saw were done by teenagers, 20-somethings with too much time on their hands. I remember an early thing in the old late, it must have been about 96 or so, the Air Force, U.S. Air Force was convinced that it was a serious cyber attack, and they tracked it down and traced it back, and they found this 15-year-old managed to get into the air, some of the Air Force's better systems. But now you make money from it. Most of the spam we receive is coming from hacked machines. So the spammers are paying the hackers to provide resources and launch this stuff. Stealing bank accounts, all kinds of ways to make money if you're not fussy about things like law and ethics. So the market has worked its magic. There's money to be made, so tools have followed and people have followed. But the applications, the really cutting edge innovative applications, were developed on a, shoe, on a shoestring by a startup in a garage in Palo Alto, or wherever, trying to ship on time and under budget by someone who barely has time to get the code sort of working and doesn't think they have the time to actually do it correctly. Yes, we all know in the software engineering business that spending the money up front will save you money in the long run, but their attitude is if they don't get out in the market, there's not going to be a long run. So they ship first, let their users test and debug later. As a result, the attackers who are following all this money have a distinct advantage. And the defenders have to defend everywhere. The attackers get to pick their targets. Old military maxim, uh, you know, he who defends everything defends nothing. Most countries have cyber warfare units. I heard some years ago from a non-US source that at least 130 countries had cyber warfare units. Well, I'm sure that some of them don't amount to much. 
Some of the big players seem to have very sophisticated efforts. You just have to read the papers to see about that. Often the attackers are working on behalf of their governments. But their targets are not built to national security standards. They're commercial software. The generals in the Pentagon and in the Kremlin and in Beijing and in Tel Aviv and, every, and Tehran and every place else are mostly running Windows just like everybody else. <coughs> Commercial grade software, military grade attack. This is, not a rep this is not a recipe for success in defense. We're introducing new devices and new services which have new vulnerabilities and we don't, have, we don't understand the security for it. You know, five, six years ago there was no Facebook, there were no iPhones, there was no Twitter. These things define today's internet. Why should a security model that was built five, six years ago even apply to these devices, let alone actually be effective? What are the implications of these devices? But fundamentally, what we haven't really thought about is what is really valuable. I assert that asymptotically computers are free. If you think about what a computer costs versus the cost of the people to run it and feed it and rely on it, the computer's free. Bandwidth is free. Disk space is free. Again, I'm talking asymptotically. Very small part of the budget of any organization is spent on uh, the actual hardware. People are expensive. The physical world is valuable. Data is valuable. And data is much more valuable in the aggregate. And this is the key point on this slide. One data item is not worth very much to an attacker in general. A large number of data items can be extremely valuable. So from these points, from, and from this slide, I'm setting forth what I consider a research agenda in cybersecurity. I will offer you some caveats. First, this is a personal vision. I don't know how to do most of these things. Of course, if I knew the answer, it wouldn't be research. I'd be making the rounds at the venture capitalists in Palo Alto myself. If I knew how to, actually, I wouldn't. This approach may ultimately prove to be just as futile as the Walls and Gates model has proved to be over the last 35 years. The advantage of this scheme, of the scheme I'm about to uh, put forth, is that it hasn't been mined out. We haven't, I've not yet come to the conclusion that there's nothing new here. So I assert that this is worth a try. So, there are four different modes of thought here. Four different themes, rather. Resilience, I'll go into each of these in detail. Usability, large-scale systems, and modes of thought. And these are the four thrusts of what I, my personal research agenda and what I commend to the profession as a whole. Not the product of any committee, me. Makes that way you think it's better or worse, I don't know, but it's fine. So let's look at resilience first. Today's systems are brittle. What do I mean by brittle? You know, pane of glass is brittle. You strike it once, it'll be very strong, but if you strike it once hard enough, it will shatter into many pieces. You can make it strong, but it's got this brittleness property. Software is like that. Any given subsystem can fail because of one bug. We've seen antivirus systems. We've seen intrusion detection systems. We've seen firewall systems fail because of one bug. I've seen systems that were less secure because they were running security software because the security software had the bug that let the attacker in. Why not? It's software. It can be buggy. Defense in depth is not working the way we want it to work because every layer is software and just as brittle, which means that your strength is just linear in the number of layers. I've got this firewall and this antivirus piece. Great. 
You've got two defenses, I've got two bugs to use. So we need a system that doesn't have this brittleness property. What is, how do we define this? How do we define resilience? It turns out not to be an easy task, but I'll give a couple of examples. If we start from my maxim that, uh, that it's the data that's valuable, a resilient system is one that protects most of the data most of the time. It's okay to lose a few items of data if you can protect most of it. As long as you can keep the rate of failure low enough. Low enough? How low is that? Low enough. Can you live with it? We don't need to try for absolute security. Rather, we'd like to have it. But if we can't get it, what we need to do is design our systems to have this resilience property. So I'll give an example, this is the only close to fully worked out example I have, of an e-commerce website. The typical way we do, you've got, got the net, people out there, good guys and bad guys. You've got a web server, and the web server is backed up by a database system. The web server is really the front end to the database system. A conventional design, by the conventional design will typically have the firewall in front of the web server. The technical term for that is useless because what you have to let through that firewall is port 80 or port 443, the web protocols, but those are the most dangerous protocols to let through. Turn off everything else on the machine. The machine, that's not an operator, that's not a computer, it's an appliance, it runs a web server. You go run Apache or IIS and the bare silicon for all that matters to the security of the web server. And typically, the web server has got all the controlling logic and has full access to the database. A resilient design uses a very, very restricted language for between the web server and the database. I call this language new speak, Orwell's language where you couldn't think a disloyal, couldn't express a disloyal thought. A language that's simple enough that I can write a really small, simple parser, small enough that I think I can get it right. We can get programs of a few hundred lines correct with a high degree of confidence. It's when we get to a few hundred thousand lines we get into bad, really bad trouble. We have a very simple language. We can probably get that correct. The authentication on every transaction is from the end user to the database. The web server is just the pass-through. And this means that if the user isn't active, you can't access that user's records on the database. This is where we're getting the resilience from. Maybe we even encrypt the database. Not certain we can do that. It'll take a more fleshed out design to be sure of that. With a key derived from the user's authenticator. So the rate of data compromise is limited to the rate of user activity. If I'm on Amazon logged in once a month, and there are months where I'm not logged in at all, then my account's not going to be compromised, no matter how badly the web server falls. Because most users are not active most of the time. The firewall in this scheme is protecting what's really valuable, the database. The web server, well, I don't want it hacked. You know, it's no longer front page news when a web server is hacked. It used to be, not anymore. These days, it generally doesn't make the papers at all. The web server is exposed, but it has to be. We carry this design further, this data-driven design even further. We don't really have just one database. Some years ago, I was uh, looking at a real world system, just the billing subsystem had about uh, 20, 20 different subsystems and four, I think four different databases, at least, probably more than that. Just the billing subsystem. One separate database machine that let you calculate the sales tax. 
on different kinds of transactions for people living in different states, different counties, different countries, what have you. Well, yeah, if you think about it, you need that database, but I hadn't thought about that. But then again, I hadn't built that system. Rather than the web, when you place an order, the web server doesn't update the inventory database. The driving logic is on the database side. You update the user's information saying the user has placed this order, and the user information database creates the order database and updates the inventory database. And again, every transaction is being authenticated by the end user to this user information database. A data-driven design with a crucial point, the crucial point of exposure of the databases is protected by this very simple language and the fact that every transaction is user-driven and user-authenticated. Now, it would be a good exercise to take this and build this for a real world system. I've, I've built this for a toy sized site. It would be interesting to take it for a real e-commerce site, one that could actually place orders. So what does this design do? It's restricted the failure modes. No data can be read or usefully modified without the authenticator. Only one small module really needs to be correct, and that's the one that's parsing in all these requests and authenticating it, parsing this new speak language. If our intrusion detection system works quickly enough, the rate of loss will be low because most of the data is going to remain intact. Most of the data is protected most of the time. I now also have a real use for the intrusion detection. It doesn't just tell me you've been had. It limits the rate of damage to whatever the active user rate is times you know, the interval. It'll take the IDS to uh, react. The design's not perfect. Another good exercise is to analyze it for its weak points. I do have a wall, I do have a gate, but it's a much simpler gate. Let me give another example of resilience, one that perhaps particularly resonates perhaps this winter with internet-connected thermostats. I was looking at these a few years ago. I uh, found w one brand seemed to meet all the functionality requirements, so I wondered about its security. You know, I was not, didn't get a warm, fuzzy feeling when I realized the thermostat was running a web server. The word security did not appear in, the in uh, any of the manuals. The design didn't look nearly secure enough, wasn't using enough crypto. But more to the point, yeah, buggy code. My experience with people building embedded systems that they don't think about such things. The attacker could turn off my heat in the winter, freeze the pipe, sorry Brian, I was, did not, not come up with that with you in mind. Overheat the house in the summer, dry out books and plants and so on. Even if there was enough crypto and proper authentication, which there isn't, this still is this buggy code problem. So what would be a resilient design for a thermostat? How about hardwired limit circuits? I don't ever want the temperature in my house to get below five Celsius or above, say, 40 or 45. Why should that rely on software? In fact, how about if you ever hit these extremes, just limit to something like between 10 and 35, more reasonable temperature range for a house. It's a resilient design. No matter how bad the software is in the thermostat, these limit circuits will bound the range and take control away by, from the software if it ever gets really bad. Completely separate, isolated mechanism, not accessible from the outside. So here's a resilient design for a software-controlled internet-connected thermostat. By the way, New York, if you live in New York City, Con Ed will be happy to give you a free internet programmable thermostat. Why? Because this way, when they're dealing with peak loads, they can go adjust your thermostat a little bit. 
great. It's not only internet connected, but I've granted to a third party the right to go adjust it. What a wonderful thought. It's not just my thermostat security, but Con Ed security. Defining resilience isn't easy. It's not just a specification problem. The, the hard part about resilient designs is defining what it means for any given application to be resilient. After that, is a very different thought process than we're accustomed to for how to divide the system up into modules to get the proper security guarantees. This is not the way we're accustomed to designing systems. We have to learn how to do it this way. And that's after we can define resilience. That's it. Defining resilience is hard. We, uh, what's a resilient car engine computer? Cars today have 50 or 60 microprocessors all networked. Some network to the outside by things like Bluetooth and worse. The uh, first cars to have engine control computers had a little manual override switch under the hood. If the computer died, you could at least get home. But what is the design for a really sophisticated uh, modern car with its dozens of computers? What about the power grid? Crucial target. But connecting the different generators requires very tight synchronization of phase, frequency, and voltage. It's really hard to do that without computers. What is the equivalent of resilience there that doesn't involve serious partition of the grid, given that we have lots of areas that consume far more power than they can possibly generate locally? It's not an easy question. I do not know how to define resilience. Yes. Yeah. At some point, the merchant will want to touch all the user information, even those who are not currently involved in the transaction, and they can be in response to your transaction to offer you registration or something. So, how does that fit into the the idea that that only you know end user authentication? Well, this is one reason why it's probably not feasible to encrypt the data, but Again, in this design, this design is designed to uh, protect stuff coming in from the outside. We have a different path for requests coming in from the back end. And uh, how much you have to stress the resilience on that part is another interesting question. If you're dealing with a military grade target, you certainly have to think about that. If you're dealing with a, with a merchant, you might not have to. But yeah, I, I said, I do not have, I have a toy implementation of that. I don't have a fully worked in implementation of that. Uh, you know, I joked about why is there a firewall in front of the web server? And part of the reason is someone's got to maintain the thing. You still have to figure out a maintenance path to that. Uh, it's a lot more complicated than I have time to discuss that example here today. I'm already running a little short on time. I want to get to the other three themes, though. OK. Let's talk about usability. Today's systems are fundamentally incomprehensible. One reason that phishing attacks succeed is that alternatives to passwords, to reusable passwords, are just too inconvenient. We know how to do authentication properly. We've known how to for a long time. Challenge response authentication in the military context, go, military electronics goes back to the 1950s with the so-called IFF, identify friend or foe radar systems. Users don't like other alternatives. People can't re understand the access control implications. Skilled administrators find it very difficult, bordering on impossible to set up IPsec virtual private networks. I, uh, I know at least two different people with literally decades of experience with security and networking who've complained about trying to set up IPsec and said they weren't certain they'd gotten it right. You know, if these people, experts in the stuff, can't do it correctly, what, what hope do normal people have? And access control policies are absolutely mind-bogglingly incomprehensible. We have a 
paper we're working on now uh, did a Facebook privacy setting. Survey of people to see whether their privacy settings matched what they thought they were on the items on their Facebook pages. Get what, guess what percentage of people had at least one error? Anyone? 100, yes. 100%. Most people, I think 95% of people were uh, hiding stuff they meant to show, and 85% of people were showing stuff they meant to hide. I got the percentages backwards, but yeah. Overwhelming majority of people were making mistakes. 100% of people had at least one mistake. They don't know. Regardless of what you think about Facebook in general, people were not getting their privacy settings right by their own standards. It's not by my standards of what they should expose. It was their standards that they were not meeting. So here's a way to simplify IPsec configuration. I will take at least partial blame for IPsec coming out the way it did because I was inv heavily involved in it in the IETF at the time. Let's take a sample VPN topology. We've got two remote nodes, the 11.1 and 12.1. And they're just out there on the internet, but they want to have some remote connectivity. This gateway machine inside the double circle to this network that's the oval down at the bottom. Today, you would have to configure three separate boxes, each of which would be incredibly strange. Because there's, a, a, by actual count, all of no different options that you have to understand and set. Most of which you don't care about, don't even understand what the options are. We build a system we call simple IPsec, where you have a short, simple configuration file where you get to make exactly one policy decision, and there's exactly one option. And it reads this language, it parses it, and all you tell it about the different no tell the topology and the operating systems involved. And it builds IPsec configuration files. We've got about three or four different backends right now. It builds IPsec configuration files for these different IPsec stacks. Because we went to the trouble of understanding enough of the options and figuring out which, how to tell it to ignore most of them. So you don't have to worry about the timeout for phase three and a half of uh, Ike main mode uh, when dealing with quick motors, whatever it is. Because most of those options never should have existed. And for 95 to 99% of the sites, you don't have to touch them. So this builds the configuration files and ships it out. Basically compiles one simple topology statement. And if you had an accurate database of all your computers and their operating systems, which you should but you don't, we could probably simplify it even further. So there's the hosts and the gateway to that network, and that's about it. If you want, well, how do you authenticate? Well, I'm a big fan of certificates for authentication. Config, build, uh, con generating X509 certificates via OpenSSL is at least as complicated as uh, IPsec. So we generate them for you. We do not need uh, PKIs with root key ceremony. I hear the phrase root key ceremony. I think of a high priest in robes. You know, This is now our blessed key. No, it's an authentication token. This code will generate it for you and just ship it out. The only option you get is, my users already have certificates. We don't have to generate them. It's the only option. And the only policy decision, people on the outside, the road warriors with their VPN nodes, do they have to come back in through the corporate firewall before going out for whatever benefit the corporate firewall gives you? It's the only policy decision. Everything else, you know, we control the horizontal, we control the vertical, and it's the twilight zone. So the whole system is configured in one operation. Most of the complexity is hidden. There's no way even to specify these options that never should have existed in the first place. All the complexity, like certificate generation, is hidden. Another example of usability I refer to, access control. Nobody knows how to configure access control, especially for a distributed system. There are too many interactions, and the effects of any change are not obvious. There are really two questions you want to be able to ask of any access control policy, any given policy. What, or change, what operations 
are now impossible because I've tightened some security? And what operations are now permitted? What good things do I want to do can't I do because I've tightened too much? What bad things that I don't want are now possible because I've loosened too much? These are the questions you want to be able to ask. But how do you ask this? You can't. And people will get frustrated trying to set their access control and generally make it wide open. I can't fix it. Even if you think you've got it correct, you have no assurance. So the whole issue of usability of access control is a very serious one. Talk about large-scale systems here for a moment. Today's interesting systems are not one computer. There are many interconnected systems. Each one is a point of vulnerability. I, this was a uh, lesson I first really learned a fair number of years ago. Is that a talk back when I was at Bell Labs, Murray Hill, and somebody outside speak was presenting a design for a secure operating system. And Bob Morris, who knew more than most about secure operating systems, looked at it and said, how do you do backup restore? The system was so secure there was no way to take a backup dump. And so secure that if you had one, you couldn't just restore the system to the way it was. It wasn't an operable system. So OK, you've got to go weaken your whole glorious security model to have this backup restore. Because I, I don't know about you, but I lose far more files to accidents and clumsy fingers than I do to uh, hackers. But now I've got my backup disk, server, tape, what have you. That's a weak point. Many, many more systems. When I teach my security architecture and engineering class, I've got uh, one whole lecture where I try to put to design a system in real time. A few dozen machines, different kinds of machines for a typical site. How about customer care? These are the people who've got to be able to go in and reach into every database and correct it to make it make sense again because your software has gotten it wrong. My, what a weak point. Take over one of their machines and have all the fun you want to with the database. So instead of defense in depth, we've got weakness in depth because of these large scale systems, because every system is a point of vulnerability. We need a way to understand the properties of an entire system. It's not this computer plus that computer. It's this computer plus that computer plus the way they interact. And multiply that. Exponentiate that. And each one of these subsystems is composed of many computers and many, often many additional subsystems and external links and so on. Think of that sales tax database that I mentioned. How's that getting updated? Oh, well, I guess I have to go poke a hole in the firewall to allow the vendor of that data to go send me updates every time some new city council in a part of the country I've never heard of changes the law there. Well, gee, that's a hole in my database. And by the way, uh, what other systems, what other companies does this database updating company update the databases of? OK, they update my company, they update that company over there. That company over there gets hacked, wants a data-driven attack on the database updater over there who attacks me. Is that possible? Absolutely. What are the security properties of the system as a whole? We need a way for a real-world programmer to specify the security properties of a system, just as we did for simple IPsec. And we need ways to manage our systems. I was recently asked what was my recommend three things to recommendations for enterprises to improve security. And top of my recommendation list was better care and feeding of system administrators. These are the people who are on the front lines of keeping systems up to date and patched and so on. Far too few places put enough automation into this. It's really sad if you look at the update take rates of, say, Microsoft service packs, their, you know, their mega patches, 
against the size of the corporation. The larger the corporation, the slower they are to install these patches. Why? Because too many of their applications are likely to break. Their applications are bug compatible with the current version of the system. And they, you know, they'll be off the air if their users can't access their mission critical applications. They're quite right to want to care about that. But of course, this is what leaves them very vulnerable because these patches, these service packs are fixing many security holes and the bad guys reverse engineer these things. And we have to be able to do this at scale for very large numbers of systems without really expensive buggy human intervention. It's a system, it's got to operate at scale. The last theme I have in my research agenda is what I call modes of thought. Let's leave this vaguer than the rest of the stuff. We do not know how to think about new threats or new services. We're approaching questions like this in an ad hoc fashion and trying to reason by analogy. So, what is the consequence of making a, an iPhone believe an incorrect location? Well, you know, until we had the iPhone, we didn't have internet connected devices that knew their location and would report their location out to various services. Now we do. What are the consequences here? Who's relying on the location? Who can spoof it? You know, if I'm getting the location to help me navigate, well, someone's targeting me personally, they'll send me to the wrong place. But sometimes there are access control restrictions. Major League Baseball, you cannot watch a televised baseball game over the net in the home broadcast area of a particular team because of contracts say, okay, you know, this TV station's got the monopoly on uh, this geographic area. Contracts written decades ago, well before the internet. If you spoof that, small scale spoofing, no one's particularly hurt. Large scale spoofing, economic impact. How about gambling? A lot of online gambling sites do their level best to use geolocation techniques to make sure people inside the US don't access their services. Why? Because executives from some of these companies have been arrested when they visited the US for violating US law, even though what they were doing is perfectly legal in their home countries. They see this as a fairly serious threat model. If spoofing technology comes out there and they're relying on the iPhone location, they're not taking suitable countermeasures, they might be in serious personal jeopardy. Spoofing not location on 911 calls to the police, very serious. Internet-based advertising, who cares? Again, if it's small scale. The threat is going to change depending on the application. How could we have anticipated this? How do we think about the problem? Is there a formal way to do this? The usual approach today we have is extremist. We either say there are no problems, enjoy the service, or all new services are evil and therefore have to be barred. Generally speaking, both are wrong. Though for JavaScript, I might say that was correct, but that's another. Uh, is it possible to have a useful formalism that can describe things that haven't been invented yet? Probably not, but how do we think about it? You know. What is being invented right now someplace inside Route 128 or in Palo Alto or in Beijing or what have you that's going to be as different five years from today as some of the services we live by today were five years ago? How do we think about this? I don't know. But this is one of the challenges going forward. So, a few conclusions. I don't think anybody, including me, wants to give up all of today's advanced service. Yeah, I'm running a Mac and I'm using an iPhone. I mean, uh, I've, this Kool-Aid is very tasty. Uh, I don't necessarily want to give up all new ones either. 
but we're more and more dependent on this increasingly fragile infrastructure. The solutions I am proposing here, the approaches I'm proposing here, may not be the best, they may not be the only ones, they may not even be correct. But we're at the point where we have to try something new. Because tinkering with the mechanisms, at the mechanisms that are, you know, the uh, user kernel mode bit, I believe, goes back to about 1960. And that's the fundamental wall gate. Firewall goes back to about 1980. They're not working. We've got to do something different. A few references that talk about uh, some of the th some essays I've written at various times lay out some of these points in somewhat more detail. There's also a tech report on uh, simple IPsec and on the uh, new speak uh, language for the e-commerce sites you can find on my web page. Any questions? Yes. You know, I, one of the points about the simple IPsec project was I called the paper as much a technical editorial on how to design protocols. When you design a, you know, this is saying in the standards, but the nice thing about standards is that there's so many to choose from. When you build something like an IPsec with so many different options, you know that different vendors are going to take different subsets. You know that not everyone's going to implement everything correctly. And yeah, you may not be able to do it because we designed that standard wrong. The, the design process got away. It got, I don't. That's a whole separate lecture. Scott knows it just as well as I do. Is process fault, shall we say? Uh, and when you design something complex, you have to expect trouble. And there's a serious lesson there in interoperability. Yes. So. Uh Mm -hmm. I was wondering if you had thoughts on making things like protecting availability. No. <laughs> uh, availability is really, really difficult. Uh, I have other thoughts on them. They're basically not, bas they're not covered here, but I don't think that availability is mined out in the same way, for, mostly for the reason that we haven't been thinking about it for 35 years. Uh, it's, there are things that have been done wrong. I was a little surprised to see that uh, oh, a couple of years ago, someone had found that by taking short bursts of computing and then going away and coming back, they get a whole new time slice, get far more of the CPU than the operating system schedule was designed to give them. And I thought that was a really amusing new paper because I first read of that attack around 1968 or so. Uh, a set of lectures by, but, by Butler Lampson, who's uh, currently at Microsoft Research and still very <coughs> active in this community. Uh, the, I, have, I, I have thoughts on general design issues for availability, but it's just, that's a separate issue, right? I'm mostly dealing with confidentiality and integrity. Because this, I think, is where the glaring failures have been for 40 years. Thanks. Other questions? Yeah. Um, so looking at each of your themes, one of the things that struck me was how um, there's often a market-based, seem to be a market-based explanation for why we fail so badly in the different terms. So when the terms is resilient, there's like this natural trade-off here between resilience and efficiency. So you can design your system. I don't know that it's more costly. We have basically haven't tried it. We haven't designed systems from this perspective. Would it turn out more costly? Perhaps. I think not seriously so. But 
The cost that concerns me more is the design, development, and uh, maintenance time, not the CPU time. As I said, computers are free. So when you think of like, you know, what was the name of uh, critical infrastructure? They had separate networks, you know, you had computers controlled uh, that were not completely separated from the internet, but uh, companies decided to sort of merge them and, and bring them over to IP-based protocols, and that is, by definition, less resilient, but more efficient because you're not having to pay people you know, seven engineers Right, so they, the problem is they just did the interconnection without thinking about the resilience of the design. They believed that their wall was strong enough even without the air gap. They sell, they sell the cost, you know, just cost of maintaining the network. It wasn't, I don't even think, think it was much the reduction in the cost of maintenance as opposed to the increased abilities they gained for more interconnection. Uh, you know, more than once when I was running systems out in the real world, I'd be called in on an emergency basis when the operators and the ordinary support engineers couldn't deal with it and they had to go back to designers and developers and people in research at Bell Labs. And uh, you've got to plan for that and design for that when you're designing a system. You're going to need the emergency access capability. How do you do that correctly? Uh, I they made the interconnection didn't think, and didn't think about the whole security problem. Yeah, there will be more expense there, I almost certainly. It's not the computer time. It's the people I mean, Leased lines, computers, these are all very cheap by today's standards. My worry about putting more systems in is that I've increased the cost of system administration, but see my comments on automating system administration. The dedicated servers are a lot harder to automate than the uh, more or less identical desktop stuff. Other questions? Yeah. So in your talk you mentioned the you know, fact that the first five like gates that we kind of built was the uh, the CPL bit. Um, what are your thoughts on uh, Microsoft Singularity and like, the social media stuff to be included in the uh, security? I'm not I'm not familiar with it in detail, but I don't think the mechanism is as important as if you have a Privileged program, however you invoke it, it's a gate. You know, a fundamentally different system architecture like Plan 9 from Bell Labs, which was designed to be a completely distributed system with, we just don't trust any of the user machines, would I think be useful, but remember that it's not just an operating system user, it's not just a kernel user land problem. Your web browser, your word processor are uh, at least as vulnerable and perhaps more so today. We have attacks happening purely at the unprivileged user level. I think a useful exercise is think of a web server and imagine it was not running on an operating system. Why do you run Apache on top of an OS? Well, the file system is useful and the device drivers for the network are useful. But the, the privilege protection mechanisms are not doing you any good. This is a dedicated web server appliance. There is a privilege boundary, but it's not between the kernel and user land. It's between the web server, for perhaps the web server and the CGI scripts or whatever that are running. But it's really between the CGI scripts and the stuff that's coming over the wire. Because the CGI scripts are the real purpose of that box. They're what's implementing your business mm -hmm. logic. That's where all the interesting stuff's taking place. The rest is a network file system, plus these CGI scripts. It's not a question of a, priv of, of a privilege bit. It's a question of, I can't secure this thing that's far too large to be secured. Other questions? No? Thanks for coming.